Ikajai, Shimadi Lassi Devi Gajai, Samarina Bhakta, Vrindi Gajai. Go, <coughs> Premananda, Hari 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 Go. All glories, he assembled the votees. All glories, he assembled the votees. All glories, he assembled the votees. All glories to she, Guru and Go, Ranga, Shila Pabupad, Ki Jai, Go, Premananda. So. So we finished chapter four already. Okay, okay. <clears throat> so we're going to do our nectar devotion classes and read from Shri Prabhupada's nectar devotion, which is based upon the Bhakti uh, Rasam Arita Sindhu, which means the ocean of the nectar of devotional service. <coughs> so. <coughs> Nana Shastra, Vichana Nika 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 Namely, Sri Sanatan Goswami, Sri Rupa Goswami, Sri Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, Sri Raghunath Das Goswami, Sri Jiva Goswami, and Sri Gopal Bhatta Goswami, who are very expert in scrutinizingly studying all the revealed scriptures with the aim of establishing eternal religious principles for the benefit of all human beings. Thus, they are honored all over the three worlds, and they are worth taking shelter of because they are absorbed in the mood of the gopis and are engaged in the transcendental loving service of Radha and Krishna. Maybe someone can straighten that picture up. It's Whenever I see a crooked picture, I get disturbed. A picture of Krishna. If it's a picture of Ravan, I don't get disturbed. It's crooked. <laughs> a picture of Krishna should never be crooked like that. Look, don't drop it. Okay. So, the purity of devotional service. All of the previous instructions imparted by Srila Rupa Goswami in his broad statements can be summarized thus, as long as one is materially inclined... <laughs> no, 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 no. The other way, the other way. Slightly, slightly. Okay. No. Yes. Yeah, more or less. Not really. <laughs> Little bit tilted. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, as long as one is materially inclined or desirous of merging into the spiritual effulgence, one cannot enter into the realm of pure devotional service. Next, Srila Rupa Goswami states that devotional service is transcendental to all material considerations and that it is not limited to any particular country, class, society, or circumstance. As stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Devotional service is transcendental and has no cause. Devotional service is executed without any hope for gain, and it cannot be checked by any material circumstances. It is open for all without any distinction, and it is the constitutional occupation of the living entities. Prabhupada's making indirect uh, or direct reference to this verse. Savai pum sam paral dharma yato bhakti roksa that devotional service is a topmost occupation for all living entities <coughs> and it is not deterred under any circumstance and there is no material condition to execute devotional service, a prerequisite. In the Middle Ages, after the disappearance of Lord Chaitanya's great associate, Lord Nityananda, a class of priestly persons claiming to be the descendants of Nityananda calling themselves the Goswami caste. They further claim that the practice and spreading of devotional service belonged only to their particular class, which was known as the Nichananda Vamsha. In this way, they exercised their artificial power for some time until Srila Bhakti Saranta Saraswati Thakur, the powerful Acharya, the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, completely smashed their idea. <laughs> It was a great hard struggle for some time, but it has turned out successfully and it is now correctly and practically established 
that devotional service is not restricted to a particular class of men. Besides this, anyone who is engaged in devotional service is already at the status of being a high-class Brahmana. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's struggle for this movement has come out successful. Hmm. In fact, they actually even tried to kill Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. They bribed the policeman and the police chief. And the police chief said, normally we have no problems taking bribes and getting people killed. That's our system. But in the case of a great sadhu, we're afraid to do it. And another time they went on a pilgrimage and, uh, in Vrindavan, and actually the storekeepers, everyone closed all the temples so they couldn't enter. They were so upset. Because they were just like into this ritualistic, uh, hereditary Brahminical status. It is on the basis of, this, of his position that anyone can now become a Gaudiya Vaishnava from any part of the world or any part of the universe. Anyone who is a pure Vaishnava is situated transcendentally and therefore the highest qualification in the material world not only to be in the mode of goodness has already been achieved by such a person. Our Krishna consciousness movement in the Western world is based on the above-mentioned proposition of Shilvakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada, our spiritual master. On his authority, we are claiming members from all sections of the Western countries. The so-called Brahmanas claim that one who is not born into a Brahmin family cannot receive the sacred thread and cannot become a high-grade Vaishnava. But we do not accept such a theory because it is not supported by Rupa Goswami nor by the strength of the various scriptures. Uh, little description, of, little stories about this. That one time the devotees went to uh, one of the temples of one of these ritualistic Brahmanas and the ritualistic Brahmana said, I'm blessing you so in your next life you can take birth in the proper families and then become Krishna conscious and then you can worship the deities so they went back and told Prabhupada this story and Prabhupada said you should tell him that you're blessing him so next life he can take birth in the Krishna conscious <laughs> movement <laughs> and join the, join the Krishna conscious movement anyway I mean there's many, many stories about how we were criticized now, just a little, to get a little technical, there's uh, different paths. Uh, there's the Vedic path, there's the Pancharatriki path, like this, and the Bhagavad Vidi path. Vidi, of course, means path anyway. Bhagavad Vidi. So, these three paths are not necessarily equal. In other words, if someone is not born in a Brahmin family, they're not really, shouldn't be doing the Vedic path. Mm. Vedic path means Vedic rituals, karma khandra rituals, which you're not interested in doing anyway. You know, and uh, doing all the uh, sacrifices from the uh, Yajur Veda, mm -hmm. chanting the hymns and the Rig Veda, and that's not really what we're qualified for, nor is it important anyway. In Kali Yuga, you know, Ekon Dharma, Krishna Nam Sankirtan. So the paths that we follow are Bhagavad Vidhi and Pancharachiki Vidhi. And of those two, oh, let me explain what that is. Pancharachiki Vidhi is the uh, path of regulated devotional service, and uh, deity worship, uh, getting up early in the morning, doing your puja like that, and Tulsi worship and all that other nice stuff. Bhagavad Vidhi is reading the Srimad Bhagavatam and preaching Krishna consciousness and chanting the holy names and doing Sankirtan. That's Bhagavad Vidhi. Prabhupada described these as two different tracks. He said a train runs on two tracks, and we need both of them. He said of the two, Bhagavad Vidhi is more important than Pantarachaki Vidhi. But without Pantarachaki Vidhi, you get pretty wild. And your Bhagavad Vidhi goes down. And I traditionally give the example of, of my own experience in this, like, Many years ago, before any of you here were born, I joined the Hare Krishna movement. You remember that. <laughs> and then, when I joined the Hare Krishna movement, uh, a few months after I joined the Hare Krishna movement, what was it, a year? I was uh, traveling with the sannyasi. I was actually reading Ananda I was a brahmachari at that time. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, he told me that now you're traveling with a sannyasi, uh, so you really don't have to wake up early anymore. And as far as offering food, you know, we just go to the supermarket and Sri Vishnu, the bag of groceries. <laughs> and then at one time I actually offered the whole supermarket to Krishna. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking that, you know, there's a compassion here, prasad distribution. <laughs> I said, my dear Krishna, of course I couldn't offer the meat, but uh, my dear Krishna, whatever is acceptable in this supermarket, please accept. <laughs> So anyway, it was a, it was pretty wild. I mean, we were, at least the first few days, we were waking up, you know, at like at 7 o'clock in the morning. And of course, we chanted, you know, we chanted the japa. And then as far as prasada, we would just buy things in the supermarket, bread, you know, just regular, as they say, commie bread. <laughs> it's interesting, commie bread. <coughs> And a label. This is Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a brand of bread. <clears throat> so anyway, so <clears throat> so and we bought. Uh, you know, we had. Yeah, actually, we ate quite a bit because it was we had made salads and we bought salad dressing at the s- supermarket too. You know, the packaged salad, yeah. salad dressing, and we were just you know. Thousand Island dressing, French dressing, <laughs> Italian dressing, you know. We were having a good time. Cheese sandwiches. You know. <laughs> so then, after the first few days, we noticed that consciousness was going down. You know, we were preaching, we were chanting, but the consciousness was going down because the regulation wasn't there. So then we decided that uh, we should cook, and then so we got a gas stove and uh, and I used to cook in the back of the maxi van. Uh, it's a big cargo van. Mm-hmm. It's called a maxi van. Anyway, some of you may know what I'm talking about. And it has a wheel well in the back, you know, where the metal goes over the wheel. And I use that as a surface to roll the ro- rotis. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, we're, I mean, we took advantage of everything. You know. And so, you know, the, one of these pump gas stoves. Yeah. And sometimes I had to cook while the driving was going on. And that's oh. quite dangerous because it's, yeah. it's kerosene in there. Yeah. And you can just like have an explosion. Anyway, so, but then, you know, the consciousness went up and then we started getting up early and then we started having mangal arti mm-hmm. and uh, all night laundromats mm-hmm. which was really interesting because we put one of these mad- madrasas over the uh, over the machine, you know, the laundry machine and set up like candelabras on the side and a picture of Panchatadwa and had a whole arti. Wow. And many times some woman would come in to do her laundry in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> That's when things weren't so dangerous. Nowadays I don't think they have all, all night laundromats anymore. But you know, people, there was no terrorism in those days, you know, and, and crime was very low. So, you know, nobody was scared of anything. We were out at night or people out, even ladies were out at night and there was no danger. So anyway, so they'd come in and they get shocked. <laughs> they see, see a bunch of brahmacharis <laughs> jumping up and down in front of a laundry machine. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> and then we had a drum too, you know, drum and cartels too. It was quite shocking. For of course, as they say in ISKCON, they got purified. <laughs> I said, the lady had a heart attack and left her body <laughs> in the middle of cure time. <laughs> I wonder what she was thinking, you know. <laughs> yeah, we we were pretty weird. I mean, even when we would go to uh, campgrounds, and it was cold out, it was like freezing, mm-hmm. you know, snow on the ground and everything. And then we'd use the cam- we'd use the uh, bathroom in the camp- campground to chant Hare Krishna. Not to do RT, but we would mm-hmm. chant our job inside, because it was warm inside mm-hmm. the bathroom. You know, big public bathroom. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, some man would walk in, because ladies wouldn't walk into a man's bathroom, but the man would walk in to shave himself. <laughs> <laughs> and you have all these Hare Krishna, that always, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> you know, it's really... Uh, what was that reaction? <laughs> was the reaction? I never asked them, you know. 
you know, it's just like you're young and you you think yeah. they don't you don't care, you know, what mm. people think. When you're young, you're just like, we're Hare Krishnas, and, <laughs> and, you know, if you don't like it, we're going to chant a little louder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was weird. I mean, from my perspective right now, it was weird. Like, at, even on Hari Nam, you know, there'd be some old lady in the street, and then we go with a Sankirtan party in the cir- circle. <laughs> and the poor lady. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, we just form a line around it. <laughs> we just thought, you know, this is compassion. <laughs> we were pretty weird <laughs> in those days, but anyway. So, uh, so anyway, so that's... So, Pantaratraki Vidhi, getting back to the point, and Bhagavad Vidhi are important, but of the two, Bhagavad Vidhi is more important. Now, if you just do Pantaratraki Vidhi, then you just really get into basically Niamagraha after a while. Niamagraha. Niamagraha means, you know, you're doing your devotional service, but you forget the goal, and you're not properly hearing and chanting. Mm-hmm. Because the, all the different types of devotional service are dependent on Shravanam and Kirtanam. And that's Bhagavad Vidhi, right there. And, you know, Archanam, and Dasham, and Sakya, and Atmanivedana, and Vandanam, they're all dependent upon Shravanam and Kirtanam. So Bhagavad Vidhi is actually the most important thing. But other things should not be neglected. So we'll go on. Shilurupa Goswami specifically mentions that every man has his birthright, and that includes the ladies, uh, to accept devotional service and become Krishna conscious. He has given many evidences from many scriptures, and he has especially quoted one passage from the Padma Purana, wherein the sage Vashishta tells King Dilipa, my dear king, everyone has the right to execute devotional service just as he has the right to take early bath in the month of Magh, December, January. There's more evidence in the Skanda Purana in the Akashi Konda portion where it is said, in the country known as Mayura, uh, Mayura Dvaja, the lower class people who are considered less than Shudras are also initiated in the Vaishnava cult of devotional service and when they are properly dressed with tilak on their bodies, and beads in their hands and on their necks, they appear to be coming from Vaikuntha. In fact, they look so very beautiful that immediately they surpass the ordinary brahmanas. And you actually see this when someone is dressed properly, a Vaishnava is dressed properly, they actually look like they're coming from Vaikuntha. Thus, a Vaishnava automatically becomes a brahman. This idea is also supported by Sanatana Goswami in his book, Huri Bhakti Vilas, which is the Vaishnava guide. Therein he has clearly stated that any person who is properly initiated into the Vaishnava cult certainly becomes a Brahmana as much as the metal known as Kongsa, bell metal, is turned into gold by the mixture of mercury. A bona fide spiritual master, under the guidance of authorities, can turn anyone to the Vaishnava cult so that naturally he may come to the topmost position of a brahmana. Srila Rupa Goswami warns, however, that if a person is properly initiated by a bona fide spiritual master, he should not think that simply by the acceptance of such initiation, his business is then finished. One still has to follow the rules and regulations very carefully if after accepting the spiritual master and being initiated, one does not follow the rules and regulations of devotional service, then he is again fallen. One must be very vigilant to remember that he is the part and parcel of the transcendental body of Krishna and that it is his duty as part and parcel to give service to the whole, to or Krishna. If we do not render service to Krishna, then again we fall down. In other words, simply becoming initiated <coughs> does not elevate one to the position of a high-class brahmana. One also has to discharge the duties and follow the regulative principles very rigidly. Mm. So, and of course, that's the typical example we use of Punar Mucha Baba. I think you all know that story. Yes. That Punar Mucha Baba means again become a mouse. And that's the story, very quickly, of uh, the uh, once upon a time. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a rat, or a mouse, sorry. 
and the mouse was being harassed by a cat. And so he went to a sage, and he said to my to sage, my dear sage, help me. And the sage turned him into a cat. And then the cat was being harassed by a dog. And so he went to the sage, and the sage said, okay, become a dog. And then the dog was being harassed by a tiger. And so he went to the sage, and the sage said, all right, become a tiger. And then the tiger was being harassed by an eight-legged it's called Shabra Beast. And he, the sage says, okay, become one of those beasts. And then the beast began to chant the Prashana Mantra after that, <laughs> looking at the sage. <clears throat> and the sage said, Puna Mushigababa, again become a mouse. So the whole point is that whatever we were before, if we neglect the regulative principles, then we go back to that particular platform. And so... That's especially dangerous if someone was in the mode of ignorance before, like, you know, smoking marijuana, whatever. Now, in many countries, actually, it's, marijuana is becoming legal. Here, too? Yes. <clears throat> For the patients. For the patients. And I just, I just read that the new breeds of marijuana are actually more potent than the old ones, of people getting psychoses from smoking. Anyway, apart from that, Whatever one was doing before, whatever state of consciousness one was in before, it just comes back to you. And then, so you have to be really careful to be strict. Otherwise, who you were before comes back. Otherwise, we don't remember, we're not supposed to remember a person's background. We're not supposed to talk about that. That's offensive. Yeah, if you say, uh, Christian Chandra, before I met you, you were on the street smoking marijuana. Oh. You know, so you know, I'm not taking you very seriously. So, not that he was, but anyway. Oh. He was born in a Vaishnav family. Mm. And so, uh, we should never remember someone's past, at least mm. sinful past. Mm. If they have a devotional past, that's kind of nice to remember that. Srila Rupa Goswami also says that if one is regularly discharging devotional service, there will be no question of fall down. But even if circumstantially there is some fall down, the Vaishnava need have nothing to do with the prayas chitta, the ritualistic ceremony for purification. If someone falls down from the principles of devotional service, he need not take to the prayas chitta performances for reformation. He simply has to execute the rules and regulations for discharging <coughs> devotional service, and this is sufficient for his reinstatement. This is the mystery of the Vaishnava devotional cult. <clears throat> There's actually one story uh, where one devotee, somehow or other, he ate by accident in a Muslim's house, and he thought he had lost the caste, then he went to a Brahmin, and the Brahmin said, uh, he asked the Brahmin, what am I supposed to do? You know, I've fallen down from my, you know, mm. whatever, from my situation. And the Brahmin said, uh, drink some molten metal, and that's the austerity, that's the price. Uh, and he didn't like that. And then he went to the Vaishnava, and the Vaishnava said, No, just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, of course, Prabhupada here says, circumstantially, if there's some fall down, that means accidental. That's why when Krishna says, uh, My devotee, in spite of the most abominable action, is to be considered saintly because he's rightly situated, that refers, that abominable, abominable action refers to an accidental deviation, not a pre-mated, premeditated deviation. Like one time there was a devotee who had, anyway, this is an interesting story. He had, uh, someone ran away with his wife. And this devotee planned and planned and planned and he killed the person who ran away with his wife. And so then he quoted from this Shastrik injunction <laughs> that if someone steals your wife, if someone sets on fire, if someone, you know, whatever, then you can attack them and kill them. And the devotees asked Prabhupada, is this true? And Prabhupada said, no. The point is, if someone is in the act of kidnapping your wife and she's not going voluntarily, mm -hmm. 
you know, most of the times the ladies go voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just a, you know, very few kidnapping cases like that. And uh, just like when Robin, he would kidnap these girls, even though they were married, they were happy to be with him. And he he was cursed anyway to die if he forced himself upon a woman. So, so anyway, so so the point is, the prophet said that no, he did the wrong thing. And secondly, it's not that he's considered saintly because he premeditated the wrong thing. Like if you're going, let's say if you're preaching and you go to the university dormitory or whatever and they're smoking marijuana and you breathe the air. Mm. That's an unpremeditated accidental fall down. You, you go <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, remember, I remember preaching in the university, and sometimes the air was so thick with marijuana smoke, you couldn't even see the persons in the room. Yeah. So you guys, I go in and get a little dizzy, you know. Because we go door to door in the dormitories. You know, this is, we were very tricky. We would go into the dormitories and on each floor there would be something called a resident assistant, you know, one of the students who actually uh, took care of all the other students. And he would eventually catch us. And he, he would say, uh, you know, you got to get out of here. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll leave. And he says, is there anyone else? And I said, no, and even though there was another devotee. And then I'd switch floors. We'd you know, like jump from one floor to another. Anyway. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> Only one time I got arrested. <laughs> and, they, and they let me out pretty quickly because I started chanting Hare Krishna so loud. <laughs> <laughs> the other, the other, I, they took away my neck beads and my glasses and everything, and I had, they gave me a tin cup, and I was banging it on the walls and chanting. <laughs> they said, you get out of here. <laughs> So that, that's a way to get free from prison. Anyway, so, so pra- practically, there are three processes for elevating one to the platform of spiritual consciousness. These processes are called karma, jnana, and bhakti. Ritualistic performances are in the field of karma. Speculative processes are in the field of jnana. One who is taken to bhakti, the devotional service of the Lord, need have nothing to do with karma or jnana. It has been already explained that pure devotional service is without any tinge of karma or jnana. Bhakti should have no tinge of philosophical speculation or ritualistic performances. And of course, that's in reference to the nutshell verse of the whole nectar of devotion. That uh, this devotional service is, well, that defines devotional service positively and negatively. That devotional service is devoid of any fruit of desire or even the desire for liberation. And positively, it's uh, done with a positive attitude, a devotional attitude. It's active and in accordance to the Lord's desire. In this connection, Srila Rupa Goswami gives evidence from Srimad Bhagavatam 11th Canto, 21st chapter, verse 2, in which Lord Krishna says to Uddhava, the distinction between qualification and disqualification may be made in this way. Persons who are already elevated and discharging devotional service will never again take shelter in the process of fruit of activity or philosophical speculation. If one sticks to devotional service and is conducted by regulative principles given by the authorities and acharyas, that is the best qualification. This statement is supported in Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 5th Chapter, verse 17, wherein Narada, Sri Narada Muni advises Vyasadeva thus, Even if one does not execute his specific occupational duty, but immediately takes direct shelter of the lotus feet of Hari, Krishna, there will be no fault on his part, and in all circumstances his position is secure. Even if, by some bad association, he falls down while executing devotional service, or if he doesn't finish the complete course of devotional service and dies untimely, still he is not at a loss. A person who is simply discharging his occupational duty in Varna and Ashram, however, 
with no Krishna consciousness practically does not gain the true benefit of human life. The purport is that all conditioned souls who are engaged very frantically in activities for sense gratification without knowing that this process will never help them out of the material contamination are warded only with repeated births and deaths. In the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, it is clearly stated by Rishabhdev to his sons, persons engaged in fruitive activities are repeatedly accepting birth and death, and until they develop a loving feeling for Vasudeva, there will be no question of getting out from these stringent laws of material nature. As such, any person who is very seriously engaged in his occupational duties in the Varna and Ashrams and who does not develop love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vasudeva, should be understood to be simply spoiling his human form of life. This is confirmed in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th chapter, verse 32, in which the Lord says to Uddhava, My dear Uddhava, any person who takes shelter of me in complete surrender and follows my instructions, giving up all occupational duties, is to be considered the first-class man. In this statement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, it is understood that people who are generally attracted to philanthropic, ethical, moral, altruistic, political, and social welfare activities may be considered nice men only in the calculation of the material world. From Srimad Bhagavatam and other authentic Vedic scriptures, we learn further that if a person simply acts in Krishna consciousness and discharges devotional service, he is considered to be far, far better situated than all those persons engaged in philanthropic, ethical, moral, altruistic, and social welfare activities. So, the problem with all these activities, you know, ethical, moral, altruistic, and social welfare activities, is that generally you end up helping people who are breaking the regulated principles. Mm -hmm. Just like I was speaking to one of my disciples the other day, and she was saying, you know, she feels so bad when she sees the, I'm trying to think of a politically correct word for bum. <laughs> uh, she sees the chal the home challenged, you know. <laughs> anyway, the homel homeless, that's also not so nice. She sees the challenged people in the street, in the city, and she gives them money. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, you know, if you give them money, what are they going to spend it on? They're going to spend it on liquor, cigarettes, mm -hmm. and whatever. And you're going to be responsible for that. And even like, you know, if you give something in the mode of goodness to someone, let's say if it's in the proper place, proper circumstance, we're not talking about spiritual right now, you, uh, you have to come back to receive that back from them in the next life. Yeah. So you have to take birth again because they have to pay you back. And uh, also, the mode of good is activities entangle one with a false sense of material happiness. Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. So one has to be careful. I mean, yeah, we feel sorry for people, so give them prasadam. And of course, when you give them prasadam, they say, I don't want prasadam. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But that's all right. Yeah. That's all you should give them. Because if, they, if you give them something, except in Vrindavan, then, you know, I give people Lakshmi in Vrindavan. Because they're Brajabhasis. But other than that, you know, other than that, I will not give charity. Mm. Why? Because people will misuse it, you know. The material world is such that practically anything you do, you're contributing to people's sinful activities. Mm. We had this discussion about, in Fiji, about a devotee, or several devotees who make their living uh, selling kava. Mm. You know, kava. Mm. And they were saying, should we stop? And I said, well, whatever you do, at least you're making money and using the money in Christian service. I said, we have some devotees who drive a taxi. Mm -hmm. And if you drive a taxi, sometimes you have to transport meat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, practically speaking, you're connected, but we should be careful not to voluntarily help someone in their sinful activities. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a doctor, you're curing someone. I mean, sometimes you've got to give them injections that have eggs in them, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. I thought the flu shot has eggs in it. They're changing every year. Every year it changes. 
I mean, sometimes you got to do that. And what can you do? And then, and the person you're curing, you know, they're going to go out and get drunk and do all sorts of things that are not right. They're not halal. So, <laughs> or kosher, or paka, or depending on which language you're talking. And then you just, you know, you can't avoid that. But it, we we should really, as far as our voluntary activities, we should always not we should not engage in things that are just mode of goodness with a false sense that we're helping people, because you're not really helping people. The same thing is more em- emphatically confirmed in Shrimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 5th Chapter, verse 41, which Karabhanjana Muni addresses Maharaj Nimi as follows, My dear king, if someone gives up his occupational duties as they are prescribed for the different varnas and ashrams, but takes complete shelter, surrendering everything unto the lotus feet of the Lord, such a person is no more a debtor nor he has any obligation to perform the different kinds of activities we render to the great sages, ancestors, living entities, and family and society members. I'd like that first when I joined the movement. Because my mother once said, you have a debt to me, you have to come back. And I said, no, we have no debt. (laughs) One has to be careful not to be heartless in the application. I said, I I have no debt, plus because I'm a devotee, you know, you're getting, so many relatives get the benefit, you know, 10, 11, 12 generations backwards and forwards. You may die out of separation from me, but then you'll be thinking of me and go back to God. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that, it's definitely like a misuse, a cruel use of philosophy. You know, this is the early days, the early days of the Hare Krishna movement. Ma means Maya. <laughs> That's another favorite quote, the favorite quote we had. <laughs> well, and that's why Prabhupada came to America, because the Americans were like that. You know, practically any other country in the world, if Prabhupada, like Prabhupada was in India and asked uh, parents to give their children to Krishna, or at least one son, and nobody did it. Prabhupada came to America and said, all right. Mm-hmm. And the parents were so upset with Prabhupada mm-hmm. that uh, I remember uh, Gargamuni and Brahmananda's mother, she was so upset with Prabhupada. And she came to the temple one time, and uh, Prabhupada, you know, being very bold, said to her, Could you give a donation? <laughs> 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 and then she, then she said, she actually, she actually said, I said, I've given you my both my sons. What else do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know, then they were from a Jewish family, so the mother was really upset. Anyway, nor <laughs> nor has he any need to bother executing the five kinds of yagya sacrifice for becoming free from sinful up. Contamination simply by discharging devotional service, he is freed from all kinds of obligations. Uh, the purport is that as soon as a man takes his birth, he is immediately indebted to so many sources. He is indebted to the great sages because he profits by reading their authoritative scriptures and books. For example, we take advantage of the books written by Vyasadeva. Vyasadeva has left uh, for us all the Vedas before Vyasadeva's writings. The Vedic literature was simply heard, and the disciples would learn the mantras quickly by hearing and not by reading. Later on, Vyasadeva thought it wise to write down the Vedas because in this age, people are short-memoried and unable to remember all the instructions given by the spiritual master. Therefore, he left all the Vedic literature, Vedic knowledge, in the form of books such as the Puranas, Vedanta, Mahabharata, and Srimad Bhagavatam. One thing is, it, it says it's all right to give up one's prescribed duties, but in devotional service, one should work according to one's psychophysical nature. So, uh, so prescribed duties that are outside of devotional service, one renounces. But inside devotional service, there is the concept of varnashram. Uh, that's why Krishna told Arjuna to do his duty as a kshatriya. So we all have a different varna, and we should stick to the activities of our varna, except in emergency situations. Uh, there are many other sages like Shankaracharya, Gautama Muni, and Narada Muni, to whom we are indebted because we take advantage 
of their knowledge. Similarly, we are obliged to our forefathers because we take our birth in a particular family where we take all advantages and inherit property. Therefore, we are indebted to the forefathers and have to offer them pinned up prasad after they are dead. Similarly, to the people in general, we are also indebted, as well as to our relatives, friends, and even animals such as cows and dogs who render us so much service. In this way, we're indebted to the demigods, to the forefathers, to the sages, to the animals, and to the society in general. It is our duty to repay them all by proper discharge of service. But by the one stroke of devotional service, if someone gives up all obligations and simply surrenders unto the Supreme Personality of God, he is no longer a debtor nor obliged to any other source of benefit. In the Bhagavad Gita also, the Lord says, Give up all your occupations and just become surrendered unto me. I give you assurance that I shall give you protection from all sinful reactions. One may think that because he is surrendering unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he will not be able to perform all of his other obligations, but the Lord says repeatedly, don't hesitate, don't consider that because you are giving up all other engagements, there will be some flaw in your life. Don't think like that. I will give you all protection. That is the assurance of Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. Mm. And you see in the Mahabharata, mm, that Yudhisthira Maharaj <coughs> didn't completely agree with that when he was told by Krishna to lie and say that Ashwatthama is dead. Mm-hmm. And he refused to do that mm-hmm. until Krishna arranged for Bhim saying to kill the elephant Ashwatthama. And then Yudhisthira Maharaj actually lied. Mm-hmm. It's not that he told the truth by saying Ashwatthama, the elephant, mm-hmm. is dead. Mm-hmm. That's a lie also. When you say things in such a way to mislead people, you're lying. Mm -hmm. So he not only lied, but he also disobeyed the order of the Supreme Personality of Goddess. So he had the worst of both worlds. Mm -hmm. There's additional evidence in the Agastya Samhita. As the regular principles of scripture are not required by the liberated person, so the ritualistic principles indicated by the Vedic supplements are also not required for a person duly engaged in the service of Lord Ramachandra. In other words, the devotees of Lord Ramachandra or Krishna are already liberated persons and are not required to follow all the regulated principles mentioned in the ritualistic portions of the Vedic literature. So what devotee of Lord Ramachandra did not follow the rules and regulations? And he did the right thing in serving Lord Ramachandra. What way? Vibhishan. Bibishan, because Bibishan rejected his family. You know, his elder brother. Oh my God. I mean, in your culture, obeying your elder brother. Do you obey your older brother? No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> he doesn't. But in, in, in the uh, traditional Vedic culture, I mean, it's, like you see, Ram and Lakshman. I mean, even Ravana made reference to that when criticizing Vibhishan. He said, look, look how Lakshman is serving his elder brother, and this Vibhishan is useless. He's not even following the example of Ram and Lakshman. So, and then, and then there's the example in the... Uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, mm, how mm, Sarvabhoma uh, Bhattacharya's son-in-law, Amoga, Amoga, criticized Chaitanya Mahaprabhu for eating too much, which he d- wasn't. And then Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said to his daughter that my daughter, you know, Sati, is no longer married. Mm-hmm. She has no husband. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that's like a violation of ritualistic principles. The woman is supposed to stay <laughs> chaste to the husband even if he's a rakshasa. <laughs> and serve him human flesh. Anyway, so, no. But that's, you know, one of the injunctions about the chastity of woman. But at the same time, in a circumstances like that, one does not obligate it to stay with the demon. So anyway, so, anyway. Similarly, 11th canto of Shema Bhagavatam, 5th chapter, verse 42, Karabhanjana Muni, addresses King Nimi and says, My dear king, a person who has given up the worship of the demigods, like in Fiji, 
<laughs> and has completely concentrated his energy in the devotional service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead has become very, very dear to the Lord. As such, if by chance or mistake he does something which is forbidden, there is no need for him to perform any purificatory ceremonies because the Lord is situated within the heart. He takes compassion for the devotee's accidental mistake and corrects him from within. It is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita in many places that the Supreme Personality of God in Krishna takes a special interest in his devotees and declares emphatically that nothing can cause his devotees to fall down. He is always <coughs> protecting them. So, any questions? That's the end of the chapter. Questions? Yes. Good that you mentioned about in the beginning about Sarvanam and Kirtanam. So when it comes for the word Sarvanam, we have to hear. So is it like it's Katha and Kirtan as well, right? Yeah, yeah, both. But nowadays you see that we only hear that okay, today's my place, it's just a Kirtan. So we don't focus on Katha too much nowadays. Really? No Shravanam? No here, that's nectar of devotion, that's Shravanam. Mm. Well, we should hear regularly. I mean, what can I say? Devotees should be taking advantage of modern technology. Mm. To hear, there's no reason you're driving a car mm. and then you can take advantage and play some MP3s. Mm. You're chanting Joppa, you got your little Joppa thing on your face. <coughs> <laughs> Also, when we That's do a some joke, home yeah. programs. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have those? Yeah. You have one. <laughs> so, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Oh, I have 16 rounds. Parikshit <laughs> <laughs> he was Shravanam. He was Shravanam, yeah. Mm. Shravanam and Shukadeva Goswami was Kirtanam. Mm. Yeah, he was Kata. So, yeah, Shravanam, Kirtanam. And then Vishnu Smaranam. But without Shravanam Kirtan, you don't get mm-hmm. Vishnu Smaranam or any of the other processes of devotional service. So you can't neglect it. Mm-hmm. You know, there has to be regular, you know, hearing Bhagavatam class every day. Mm-hmm. Nichim Bhagavat the Seva. Mm-hmm. So, any other questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's just a practical thing that I'm going through at work. Yeah. So. We always raise money for the chopper appeal, that is a rescue helicopter. Yeah. So usually every year what we used to do is we used to cook something from home and then we used to go and sell it. But this time one of the staff came up with the idea that we'll do barbecue uh, on a Sunday. So two Sundays. So So you can do tofu bar- barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so what happened was that um, everybody said that, you know, they'll contribute so much of their time to go and sell it, so... To sell the barbecue? Yeah, to sell the barbecue. No, you have to say this against your religious principles. Yeah, so I told that, um, because every time they ridicule me, but when they go to the restaurants, I don't go, because I have to yeah. sit and, you know, so I thought, okay, I, I said, I'll come, but I'll only handle the cash. Then afterwards, I started thinking, you know, that's as, as good as selling the... Right. So I just went you, there because I told them that I'll come at that particular time. But then what I did was, I felt very. You upset just tell them. Tell them you I can't do it. So what I did was, I just gave um, forty dollars, you know, from my side. Yeah, that's right. I say, okay, that's my contribution. I can't handle this. I, I didn't even go in because the smell was so strong. Yeah, the smell. So I went away. And now the second one, as the second um, uh, collection, Sunday. is happening on uh, the coming Sunday, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. Yeah. So again, there was uh, yesterday it happened the meeting, and um, I came up and I said, and uh, they said, what time are you coming? I said, I'm not coming. They said, why are you not coming? I said, because I can't handle it. You know, I, it's against my religious principles, and I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So my manager was angry. I said, if you want, I can contribute. Then one of the staff said, oh, we don't need contribution. We need help. Mm. So I said, I'm sorry, I can't help. And then after that, I had to go and ask my manager for leave for. Day after tomorrow? Yeah. And then she said, no, you're not, you're not a team player, so I'm not going to give you leave. Because every time, you never go for any dinners, you never go for outing with us, and then you don't want <laughs> Well, you can to go, go for outing. Yeah. yeah. Outing is, they go to the restaurants, and they... So you just drink some, yeah. get a salad juice. or something. I used to take my food and I used to go and eat it. In the restaurant? Yeah. yeah. That's kind of weird. 
Well, in certain cases you have to do stuff yeah. like that for to keep your job. Yes. Yeah. I wouldn't. I, you shouldn't take part in selling the meat or making money from it. But you know, sometimes you got to do that. I mean, I had to. I had to go to my mother's 90th birthday party, and mm -hmm. they were eating, you know, all sorts of things. And I, I just explained to them, you know, and they all respect that. I mean, if they don't respect your beliefs, I think that's probably illegal if someone doesn't respect your religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? I mean, you can, that's harassment, basically. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what if, what if, if they were selling pigs and you had some Muslims working yeah, for you? Yeah, yeah. That's why I asked her because she's a Muslim. I said, uh, Fatima, just tell me, you know, I know that touching the pig is, you know, against you. Yeah. So and would you touch the pork? Then she said, Yes, I will do it. Mm -hmm. I said, you sure Then she's you not a good Muslim. No, she's not. Falling yeah. off. Yeah, I mean, a good Muslim would never. Never. Never even go near a pig or a pork. So anyway, I mean, try to participate as much as possible to keep, you know, to keep a good relationship. But at the same time, don't engage in any activity that's nefarious, like selling meat. Whew. I mean, they people. Should, yeah, but you have, you should be a team player. That is important. So you got to balance it. You got to balance it. But to be there selling, oh, I mean, it's just. Yeah. And the smell is so strong, you know, the yeah. onion and meat. Yeah, I mean, it's obnoxious. You just say, you know, it's just like a Muslim with pork. Mm. That's the very question I asked her. And she said, I mean, probably she wouldn't do it. No, she, she wouldn't do it. Yeah. She, she wouldn't do it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so much oh, no. against the Muslim beliefs. <laughs> Even if there's a pig there, they'll go to the opposite side of the street to avoid seeing the pig. I mean, that's <clears throat> good question. But yeah, go to the restaurant with them, or you either bring your own food or ask for a salad. Yeah. And Prabhupada, the, would you say one more thing? Like, you know, there's Ramayan happening in one place, yeah. and then they're having dinner. So definitely, I'm so attracted to uh, you know, prayers. So I say I want to go from the prayers. I, I, no, but in a case like that, you should, you have a responsibility in your workplace too. You can hear the reminds some other time. But you know, some, one has to be practical in this world. You know, you don't want to upset everybody in your workplace. But you know, in certain circumstances where they're handling meat or selling meat or taking cash from me, you say, you know, that. People should respect, and if they if they don't understand religion, sometimes you have to explain it as ethical. Mm. You know, in certain cases, you ha you have to explain that you know it's just my ethical belief. You know, these are animals, and it makes me cry. You know, mm. and then you could show them a film of a slaughterhouse. Oh. <laughs> you know, how could they do that? It's a, it's subhuman to eat or sell or transport meat. Mm. Subhuman. I mean, even, even like fish, a fish has an eye when you buy it and it's looking at you. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not looking, it's dead, but I mean, you just remind it. A chicken, you know, it's just such a abominable thing. Anyway, all right, anything else? So, Gurudev, in, in this case, contribution, if suppose we have to contribute something. Sometimes we have to for our workplace, yeah. If we don't, you know, then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got to do something like that. Yeah. But not that voluntarily, you know, just out of the blue, you see someone, some challenged person on the street, you just give them money. I remember when I was young, I learned that lesson before I joined the Hare Krishna movement. I was uh, in New York taking a subway or something, and there was one of these persons, and he was begging, I just need some money. To eat, and I gave him some money, and the police said you shouldn't have done that because mm -hmm. he's just going to use it to get drunk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even the police told me not to do it. So, I mean, I, you have to see, you know, judge the circumstance. I mean, in this world, we're always 
especially if you're working a job, you're always entangled, well, even if you're not working a job. I mean, just like even myself, I go and buy something mm -hmm. and giving money to a company that's going to be doing so many things. The employees are going to be eating meat, mm -hmm. making a profit. You know, if I buy something from Amazon, you know what Amazon yeah. is? Mm -hmm. You know, they're not vegetarians. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're always connected in some way yeah. with, yeah. the idea is to minimize it. You can't avoid your connection in this modern society with sinful activities. Unless you just go to the Himalayas or something like that. And this, what can you do? Okay. Here, yeah, Gurudev, we have lots of fundraising. <laughs> Sorry. You have lots of fundraising. Lots of fundraising programs here where um, it's for the good cause. So somehow... Uh, if you have to be involved in it, do it. If you don't have to be involved in it, don't do it. That's the standard. You know, if for your work, you have to be involved, you know, or it's going to create people, people are going to start criticizing the Hare Krishnas for being hard and cruel, mm -hmm. you know, then do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, try to avoid it. That's the standard. But not, not that just out of the blue, you know, you start feeling, oh, i got to help these poor homeless people mm -hmm. like that and buy meat for them or something. That should not be done voluntarily. But involuntarily, I mean, because of the circumstances, we have to do so many things in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, so many things. Mm -hmm. you know, On the do. other hand, we can pray for them. Yeah. Pray? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we pray. We should always be compassionate. Mm -hmm. We should always pray for people. We should always try to give prasadam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important way to approach people. You give them prasadam. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, a cookie or something like give them something they can relate to. Mm -hmm. I've seen too often the devotees give out like Indian sweets to people in the West. Mm -hmm. Like they go on the street and they give someone a glove mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it, It's dripping, you know. <laughs> I said, oh, here's Mahaprasana. What, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> You know, you give them a cookie instead. Yeah. <laughs> Prabhupada had us make cookies yeah. for people. Everyone likes cookies. Mm -hmm. So, so got to be practical. All these things are just like, be practical. Mm -hmm. Don't be fanatic. Be practical. Mm -hmm. But also be strict. Mm -hmm. So it's a balance. You know, it's a balance. Not one way or the other. Okay. On that happy note, we got to do the deity worship. And we got a lot of people watching. Here we are. See that. See everybody. Thousands of people. Okay. Okay.